All right, everybody, welcome to season two, episode one of the Detroit Hustle podcast. I'm your host, Melinda B. Powers. And today we have Lawrence Patrick III. He is phenomenal. I worked with him briefly when I was in New York. It was such an amazing time. And he's going to share some really great stories with us. Lawrence, how are you today? Doing great. I'm, uh, I'm uh, just having a great Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. How often do you get to say that? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. That's why I like to acknowledge it. <laughs> yes, yes. So you are in the Bay Area, correct? That's right. I'm in, uh, I'm actually in Alameda. So we're just south of Oakland. Uh, it's an okay. island just south of Oakland. So yeah, Silicon Valley, Bay Area, uh, East Bay, however you want to describe it. Okay, well, we don't want to talk about that right now. Right now, we want where you came from. So give us a That's brief right. background of where you came up in Detroit and your kind of evolution through, let's just take us up to high school before you flew the nest, and then we'll take you from there. Yeah, so um, so I actually lived, uh, the when I was really young, I lived um, on Foyer, which is um, East 8 Mile area. So that's where I really kind of started out in a in a in a small house there right by the freeway. And then um we moved to uh we moved to Canna um to Canterbury, which is in Sherwood Forest. Um, mm -hmm. I went to Hampton Elementary School there for mm -hmm. first and second grade. And then we transferred and moved uh to the North End and moved into actually the childhood home of my father and all of his siblings on King Street. Wow. And so King is just right off of what right there by St. Matthew, St. Joseph's Church. Um, but yeah, we grew up, you know, I grew up really on this in the same house where my dad was was born and raised. And so that was like really amazing. That was um, unexpected and really interesting because, you know, a lot of his um, stories like about chores and stuff like that is like in literally in the same house. So you can't really... <laughs> You can't really argue. You're like, take this trash out. And you're like, well, dad. He's like, I used to take the trash out. You take the trash out. So it's like, you know, it's real generational. But, uh, no, I, had a, I had a great experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Okay. And then what schools were you at when you had to move? Yeah. So, so, uh, so I, like I said, uh, started out at Verner Elementary, then, then went to um, Hampton, um, which is a public school. Um, and then to go lightly, and um, oh, go lightly is where I went to, to school lightly. third grade through eighth grade. I went to go lightly. Oh, um, so I there were four Bates. alternative schools in Detroit Public, mm -hmm. and I know you went to Bates. You know we used to have that rivalry happening. It was Open <laughs> Bates, Burton, and Go Lightly, and we used to have that rivalry that was like fierce. Actually, some yeah. of my best friends today um, went to Bates, and uh, but we did. We, you know, we played academic games yes. against each other. Bates always had amazing teams. Go lightly, always had amazing teams, um, and we used to just we used to just go at it. Yeah. Um, oh, and, just uh, a note on that. So much fun. Did you know yeah, that? Go lightly was a. Oh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I know we got a kind of a delay. I was just gonna. Oh, say go ahead. In that, Mr. Holstein, who you know, academic games for Bates. Yes, the legend. Rated on Friday his 50th year of teaching. Wow, I had no idea he still was still there. at it. That yes. he's the Yoda. He's the he, <laughs> yeah. he's the goat, man. He is that guy. Like we should have a. There should be a key. Should get the key to the city. There should be like a day. That's his mm -hmm. day. And yeah. like I mean, he he he's he is he has educated and trained so many young people around logic and critical thinking and, you know, and math and, you know, really advanced ways of thinking about problem solving. I mean, he's just a legend. I went to go lightly and we, we looked up to him. So. Yeah. Um, he's awesome. I mean, yeah. they had to tear him away from his classroom so he could attend the tribute <laughs> last Friday. <laughs> wow. I believe that yeah. too. I believe that yeah. he, man, that, that guy's a legend. That guy is an absolute legend. Yeah. Okay. So continue. I'm sorry. I just had to add that in. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's real. That's real Detroit talk right there. If you know who that mm -hmm. is. Um, but so, so yeah, so I went to uh, go lightly and, and, you know, these, these schools that I mentioned open Detroit open school, go lightly, Burton international and Bates Academy 
Um, these were four experimental schools that were created around a very different curriculum and a very different um, instructional approach. Each school was very unique and different. Um, Go lightly, the school I went to was a, a K-8 school um, with a lot of emphasis around um, arts and uh, computer programming mm -hmm. and, um, you know, kind of the intersection of like culture and a, a liberal arts education. And we didn't know that's what it was at the time. We just thought it was right. school. But that's actually what it was now that I'm older and more educated. And, um, you know, one thing that I just have to just just shout out about Golight is we just had amazing music teachers. Like we had Marsha McNeil. Um, we had uh, Linda Brown. We had um, Jose Taylor. I mean, and all of them were just amazing, like legendary, you know, music teachers who not, you know, they taught us how to play and they taught us the, the theory of music and how to understand it from like an intellectual standpoint, but they were so cutting edge and futuristic in their approach. And uh, we didn't know that at the time. We just, you know, we little kids just <laughs> going to school, <laughs> doing what, sometimes doing what the teachers tell us to do. Right. But in retrospect, now that I've actually been around a lot of professional musicians, like, wow, what we were getting was amazing. I was telling somebody the other day, the story about how at Golightly, we actually had a prototype for one of the first, um, you know, sequencers, like a, a music sequencer that they use to make, you know, all kinds of hip hop music today. Like okay. literally like one of the first devices that could connect to a PC. Um, we had it, we had a prototype and we were learning how to program it as little kids. I mean, I was in like oh. the fourth or fifth grade when we had this thing. Yeah, it's amazing on an Apple II computer. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, it's just, yeah, I'm just so grateful for that experience and all that we were exposed yeah. to. Yeah, almost kind of too connecting to the roots of EDM to Detroit. It is, like, it's so true. It took me so long to realize that the music we were listening to growing up was like European. <laughs> I know, that's so mind blowing when you realize that. Cosmic Rain Dance, I listen to that now like, we were jamming to this and this was not everywhere. This was yeah, our dance. That is so music. Detroit. That is yeah. so Detroit. And I have my playlist on Spotify and just realizing like the diversity of the origin of this music and where these artists were from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And um, some of it, we were just listening to it straight up. I mean, like we didn't remix it. All. Other pieces, you know, we took it and we kind of mashed it up and remixed it and put a little Detroit in it. But I mean, we just, we were appreciating kind of the future direction of where music was going, um, you know, true. really early on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so then after Go Lightly, we want to skip that era and go to the next era. <laughs> yeah, well, you know that next era is about Cast Tech. Um, yeah, so I'm real, I'm a proud Cast Technician, uh, class of 93. I had All an right. amazing experience at Cast Tech. And, um, you know, I was really active again in music there. Um, I was the president of the symphony and the uh, marching band. I was really, really into it. We actually kind of restarted the marching band when I was there, because Cass hadn't had a marching band in, in, in years, in decades. Right. And uh, David Sneed, who later um, became the superintendent for the whole school system, at the time he was our principal. And mm -hmm. of course he went to an HBCU, so he had, he had that flavor and really understood what the bands were about and how it was, you know, not, not just from an educational standpoint, but from a school spirit standpoint. And so, um, you know, Dr. Sneed, someone who, who was a CAS, uh, you know, a CAS alum, he came back and school spirit was a big priority for him. The academics, he knew that that was going to happen, but it was like school spirit. I want kids to be proud that they go here. I want them to understand a legacy and, and embrace it and appreciate it. So one of his big initiatives was the push to really reinvigorate um, school spirit. He's the one that, um, you know, brought in Coach Wiltshire and elevated him. You know, he's now, I guess he's probably the winningest coach in the PSL. I mean, he's the man, you know, he's, um, right. Cast Tech is now ranked football team. When I was there, we weren't as, you know, much of a powerhouse. That's mm -hmm. really happened over a period of time, but I give um, David Sneed a lot of credit for okay. bringing in Coach, coach Wilshire and um, Sharon Allen, who was, right. um, who was hired through a competitive process to be the band director at Cass, and she just came in. She just was 
um, relentless and fearless. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, <laughs> we 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 just stood up this marching band in like a few weeks, and uh, and you know the rest is history. Now Cass has a legendary marching band. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I came a little later in that. I was class of '98, but I heard a lot of stories. You did not tell us <laughs> yet. You've mentioned music several times, but what did you play? Well, I played different instruments. In the marching band, um, I was on the drum line. I played the bass drum. Uh, we had a lot of legendary musicians in our band at that time uh, on the drum line. For example, we had Ali Jackson, you mm-hmm. know, probably the probably greatest jazz drummer um, alive right now. Definitely right the now, greatest yeah. jazz drummer of our generation. Didn't he just move um, back to Detroit? He just moved back to the D. I yep. heard he about just bought that, a house. Yeah. He's back in Detroit. Um, he played uh, he played a special concert as part of the uh, the jazz festival this past this uh, past September. Um, but he was on our drum line. And we also had uh, Kareem Riggins for a short time uh, on our drum line there on the snare line. And of course, Kareem is a legendary um, producer, musician, composer, jazz drummer, um, plays drums with Common. He's also in um, oh, okay. uh, August Green. I mean, he's an amazing musician. He's the one who actually completed um, Jay Dilla's album when he passed. Oh, really? So, yep. So like, imagine our drum line, like our drum line was sick. Like we had ah, yeah. real, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Um, but it was a it was an amazing experience. I wouldn't trade it. It was it was so fun. We learned so much too. Awesome. So that's that's where your foundation was set in the D. And then from there you went to good old Tallahassee. Tallahassee. Yeah. So I was uh <laughs> Yeah, my, my my parents were shocked that uh that I that I chose Florida A and M University uh on the highest of seven hills. Highest um in Tallahassee. Seven. Because, you know, I had, um, I had a full academic scholarship to University of Michigan, Michigan State, um, a, lot of, a lot of different universities, um, you know, uh, made really great packages and, and offers um, to me based on, you know, my academics and, and SAT scores and stuff like that. But the thing about FAMU, and I don't know that I've ever even told this story before, but FAMU was literally the first college that tried to recruit me and what i mean is literally in the ninth grade uh i was at my i'll never forget i was at my locker in cast um you know changing classes or whatever my locker was right across from the auditorium door where um you know you could kind of escape the stage like a little secret bat bat exit and so Mm -hmm. the president of florida a m university um dr frederick humphreys he comes out of this door with the principal of the school david sneed Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm just at my locker, just doing my thing. And so the principal comes over to me and introduces me and says, uh, Lawrence, I want you to meet uh, Dr. Fred Humphreys. He's the president of Florida. And I'd never really heard of Florida A&M. This is the president of Florida A&M University. <laughs> um, you know, he just awarded thousands of dollars of scholarships to our students, you know, and then he introduced me and said, this is one of our top students. He's only a freshman, but he's on a great path. And so then Fred Humphrey says to me, he shook my hand. And, and, you know, he was, gi- he's giant. Like he's like, you right. Know, six, yeah. Whatever, he's very six, tall. Five. Yeah. Very tall. So I'm down in my locker. I'm looking up at this giant man and he shakes my hand and he says, listen, he says, if you keep your grades up, when you graduate, I'll pay for you to go to college. Wow. And he said it just like that. Now, I mean, that's the best elevator pitch <laughs> like of all time. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, I met this man. He didn't know anything about me other than the principal says I'm a good student. So he shakes my hand and says, if you keep your grades up, I will pay for you to go to college. Wow. And you know, that really stuck with me. So when it came time to look at schools, even though I had a lot of colleges sweating me, it's like I never forgot that. And so, you know, Florida and m also was unique because they, they were the only school. All of those schools offered me different types of um, packages. But Florida and m was the only school that actually called my mom. And that was very smart because my mom was dead set on me going to University of Michigan. But mm-hmm. FAMU, they called my mom and had a conversation with my mom and said, well, what do you want for him? What are your mm-hmm. dreams and hopes and aspirations for your son? And I came home that day and my mom said, well, son, you know, I've been thinking about Florida A&M. And I was like, mom, what have you been? What? What have you been <laughs> but that, that made wow. the difference. And that's, you know, that's really true. The, the mantra of the school when, when I went there was excellence with caring. Excellence with caring, yeah. Excellent, excellence with caring. And that's what I, you know, that was my experience there. Yeah. So as another alum, 
it, it it's a special place. It, I didn't have quite the same experience, and I I know you marched there. I did not. Uh, mm -hmm. I gave up marching band in high school, and Mr. Pruer got rest of soul tried to get me to audition. I just refused. I was like, no, I want a life in college. So I took a different route. Right. But... <laughs> right. 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 And the relief I felt once I was a freshman, I came on campus and I saw everyone with their horns all dirty in the cab. I was like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to be that person. Yeah, dirty. I mean, that's like, you know, it's a badge of courage. But, yeah, you would just be constantly dirty for, like, the first semester. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much. Out there on that so. patch, marching. Uh, but I respect but, you know, all those, including yourself, that took that path. You paved the way for a lot of other people. The band, you know, keeps this great reputation because of that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, the band, the band is amazing. I think the thing that was ro so romantic to me about the hundred, which is the marching band at Florida A&M, um, every every HBCU marching band has a nickname. Most, right. not everybody knows that. They all have a nickname. So band heads, we refer to them by nicknames. Mm -hmm. um, so the 100, that's, you know, the marching band for Florida A&M. thing about the 100 is that the history of it is so romantic. Like when you realize how much innovation they actually brought into all marching bands. There are many, many marching band techniques that are standard across the world that were actually created in Tallahassee by really? the 100, by Dr. William Educate P. Foster. Educate us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things like the silent four, you know, blowing the whistle and then having a four count. I mean, there, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of maneuvers, um, you know, certain marching, like actual the, the way you march with your with your legs, like the technique of marching. Um, a lot of innovations uh, that came out of out of FAMU. I, the biggest innovation was, you know, being able to blend traditional march repertoire with contemporary and mainstream popular music. That was a huge innovation that FAMU really pioneered that's, you know, really copied now by everybody. But right. um, yeah, it's just a great history, a great legacy. And it was amazing to be to be a part of that number. Um, even though I only marched briefly, it was it was an amazing okay. experience. I mean, it takes oh, oh, that's a lot of time and effort and blood, sweat and tears. I just I knew myself well enough <laughs> to know that was <laughs> <laughs> well, Cass, Cass was great preparation. I mean, one thing oh, I'll never sure. forget is when I went to FAMU and I auditioned, they kind of looked at me like, where do they make you? <laughs> Why do you know so many rudiments? Right. <laughs> How did you sight read all of that music? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they like offered me a music scholarship on the spot. But I, that was mm -hmm. Cass Tech. That was, the, that was the preparation that we had from, from eight, Benjamin eight, number one. and Darren eight, Allen. Number two. And, yeah. 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 yeah, they were the best. I mean, and and it's I kind sometimes I I kind of kick myself for not wanting to be more of a musician. I just love music. I don't necessarily love playing it. I like to listen to it and enjoy it. So that I was always a lazy musician, and they and our teachers hated that because I wasn't bad. They're like you, but you can play. I'm like yeah, but and, I mean I was a section leader, you know, in the marching band. I did that, but yeah. I just really wasn't motivated. That's to a big thing, though. Out. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, I fought my right. way. Um, but yeah, I just always had respect for all of the, the really top performers. Like, you know, Roland Hamilton, good friend of mine, excellent piano. We're still trying to get him on the broadcast. If you're listening, Roland, we're still <laughs> expecting you. Um, had to call him out. And um, so Charles Wilson, you know, we've, and we've interviewed Charles. He was on last season. So it's just awesome to see the product of that environment because it's just a fertile with so much talent so like let's not okay let's get back to you so you're at FAMU you said you marched briefly what happened in your experience at FAMU that catapulted you into the path that got you where you are now because I want to get to that because I don't know that whole yeah thing. so 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 I had a really interesting um a really interesting career path I, I was sort of on this dual track initially I thought I was I was certain I was going to be a musician what I, my, my dream was to be a composer. I wanted to be like, oh, okay. you know, William Grant Still or um, John Williams. Like I wanted to be known as um, a really respected composer who could also come up with um, infectious melodies that um, were impossible to resist um, that would stand the test of time. You know, John Williams, wow. you know, the music he created, people will be humming it, you know, until the end of time. <laughs> right. And um, I wanted to be like that. 
And so I was doing everything to prepare myself to be a composer, which is why I played so many different instruments at CAS. I played the bass drum in the marching band. I played the, the uh, electric bass and string bass in the jazz band. Uh, I was first chair viola in the symphony. I played string bass in, in this uh, symphonic band. I played tuba in the concert band, piano in the percussion ensemble. Like I, I, I played in, in every performing ensemble at CAS and music. Um, I think nine at one point. I was in nine wow. performing ensembles. And the reason why was because I was trying to understand how music works so that I could be a better composer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very hard if you are a soloist and you only focus on solo repertoire. You, it's hard to be a great composer because you don't actually pay any attention to orchestration and exactly. what, what's happening in the rest of the And how ensemble. it all fits so, together. Exactly. So that's why I was trying to do that. At the same time, I, um, I got interested in journalism and started to go down this path around working on the school newspaper, the cast technician. Mm -hmm. And um, we were very fortunate in Detroit to have leaders at the Detroit Free Press who mm -hmm. thought it was really important for you know, kids in Detroit public schools to have access to a school paper. Because you know, the school district didn't really have the resources to produce school papers. So the Free Press said, you know what, we'll print the paper. How about that? And they did. They would devote an issue, I think it was like, you know, once a month, maybe twice a month, to printing every single Detroit public school, uh, their newspaper in a special okay. section. So that was like actually where our school paper came from. One of the cool aspects of that is that when it came time to edit it, you would actually go to the Detroit Free Press building on Lafayette and actually edit it. So you would be in the newsroom and, you know, using a real computer that they used to put out the real Detroit Free Press and learning the commands and all of that. And you would interact with the, with the real reporters and editors who work there. So they also, as a result of interacting with all these young people, they said, you know, we, we can do more than this. What if we had a summer program where we brought them in to be apprentices and really understand what we do and how we do it? Maybe we can get more of them interested in careers in journalism. Mm -hmm. And so this program was created. Um, Neil Schein was the publisher at the time. Um, Heath Merriweather was the executive editor. And Bob Magruder was the managing editor. Um, and Louise Reed Ritchie, who was um, working, working for Neil, she's the one who really kind of got this off the ground to create this program. And it was, it was a basically a selective program. You had to apply. They put you through interviews and all of that. And um, they would pick like, you know, 12 students from Detroit Public Schools to come to the free press um, for, I think it might have been six weeks in the summer. Okay. And uh, it was intense. It was kind of like, Sounds this like is a it. crash course. We're going to teach you everything you need to know to be, um, you know, a young journalist. And all of the classes were taught by the editors from the Detroit Free Press, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like a boot camp. And a lot of people who came through that boot camp, you know, have gone on to do really big things um, as journalists. You know, James Thomas is um, one of the, um, one of the engineers and product folks at the New York Times. Um, he did a, a Knight Wallace Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Leslie Foster is a television news anchor for the CBS affiliate in Washington, D.C. Um, Jonna Berry is the head of content operations for Wired magazine. Mm -hmm. um, Jamel Hill came <laughs> through that. Pro like, I mean, it's just like a never ending stream of people in journalism who came through that program. We all did that program together. As a matter of fact, Jamel was in my class. We were in the same oh, group wow. that did that summer apprenticeship at the Detroit Free Press. So by the time I got to FAMU, you know, I had done internships in Detroit, apprenticeships, you know, for, uh, well, I did a one year of apprenticeship and then two internships. So I'd already done three summers working at the Detroit Free Press um, by the time I got to FAMU. And um, I was super, um, I was super excited and energized to work on the, the FAMU and the school paper at FAMU mm -hmm. and just do everything to try to like soak up everything. I was in like super sponge mode. So that's how I really took this pivot into a journalism uh, path. And I majored in journalism at FAMU, worked on the school paper, um, and just was super, um, you know, just all the way in on, uh, on becoming a journalist. And then in my sophomore year, <laughs> the internet happened <laughs> and that changed everything. Changed the game. Yeah. It changed everything. It did. So, um, with music yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs>
It did. It changed everything with music too. And actually by that time I was pretty, I was pretty invested in digital music. I mean, I was one of the only people that had like a computer, had my own computer set up in my little dorm room mm. with like a full MIDI rig. It looked like a studio. Like I had everything uh-huh. in there. It was great. People used to come <laughs> and say, how did you fit all of this in this little tiny room? Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I was, I was serious. All, all the rappers on campus used to come by and ask me to make beats for them and stuff. It was, <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. You were I just missed too. Common. Common was a few, Common was a few years before me at FAMU. Yeah. He didn't, he, yeah, so I didn't I didn't overlap with him, but I mean there was still a lot of ni- there were some nice MCs who came through FAMU. And really? as I think back on it, maybe I should have maybe I should have invested. <laughs> uh, like, been that guy. <laughs> yeah, been that guy, but yeah. So then sophomore year, the internet happened and so then what did that do with your path and your trajectory? So actually I, I actually learned about the internet at FAMU um from an alum who came back to um to try to to try to I guess give a heads up to the faculty at the journalism school about what was coming in terms of the world wide web and the internet. At that time, you know, the, the internet is really kind of the backbone. It's like the foundation. And then you have these services that sit on top of the internet. Right. And the one that we use the most nowadays is the World Wide Web. So we've kind of started to equate the World Wide Web with the internet. But at that time we were making a big distinction. And so it was really the World Wide Web which is where the www comes from in the URL. Right. Um, anyway, he was is, coming. Yeah, so this is like, so we're talking maybe like 95, 96? This is like 94. So this is the beginning 94? of 94. Okay, yeah, or sorry, the end of 94. So this is like maybe mm-hmm. August, September of 94. Okay. And this alum came back and he, he did like a Saturday workshop for faculty. And it was really only for faculty, but the dean uh, said, hey, Lawrence, you should go to this because you're really into technology. So I did. And he was right. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he just laid it out and showed us. He did like a tutorial on how to make a very, very primitive web page. Website, yeah. And yeah, the, the, the second that I did it and I hit refresh, my mind was blown. Mm-hmm. Like I, I already knew how to program and, and code. So mm-hmm. understanding the implications of this um, it just blew my mind and I completely went in a different direction. I was actually supposed to go back to Detroit that summer and do another internship at the free press. And I asked for permission to go to Silicon Valley, um, oh. because Knight Ritter, the company that owned the free press also owned the newspaper mm-hmm. record for Silicon Valley, the San Jose Mercury news. So I wrote this very detailed letter, a proposal basically saying, here's why I want to go to, to Silicon Valley and why you should let me do that. Mm. And um, and they they granted me permission, and so I did my internship um, in San Jose, at Mercury I, Center, which was the first daily news website, and that was just a huge, huge game changer because I was just right there in the mix where, you know, everything was was uh, taking off, um, right. related to the internet. Now it's funny. It just makes me think about we had a, my aunt gave my mom a computer. And I was dying to learn how to get, I'm like, we got to get on this internet thing. And so, oh, did we lose you? I think we lost Lawrence. He should, we're going to wait for him to come back. All right, there he is. Okay, I can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry about that. There you go. No, no problem. I know the internet. <laughs> the internet. It's great. Oh, so, no, I was saying I was getting ready to tell a short story. So I remember my aunt gave my mom this computer. This had to have been ninety five or ninety six. And I was like, I gotta get on the internet. How do we get on the internet? I mean, I was just plugging the phone in. I didn't know how it worked. I was just doing stuff. Right. 
And then right. we didn't have a modem or anything. I'm just plugging the phone line in like nothing's happening. So then finally my mom, right. <laughs> my mom was a teacher with DPS. So eventually uh, she was at teacher discount. We got a new Mac. And so, oh, that was game over. Once I figured that out, yeah. oh my God, hey, the <laughs> chat room. And she was like, do you date online? I was like, I look in the chat room. That was the first <laughs> online dating. That's the right. And match. It was the AOL chat room. That's right. how you met people. Mm -hmm. Right. So, the chat yeah. room. Wow, that takes the me back. Room. Yeah. And everybody, had, it was all these different interests, groups, and it was crazy, but it was like, and it, it was, was super fun too, friends. though. It was super fun. My best friend lived nine blocks away from me. We would yep. get on our computers every night and chat <laughs> and go to different chat rooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of, I kind of miss that. I mean, I, the anonymity of it and just the discovery yeah. and like that, that feeling of community is, it's hard to find it. I mean, there are a few places, uh -huh. you know, Reddit uh, or yeah. whatever. I mean, you know, people make private groups now. So, I mean, people right. still do it, but. A little bit different. Changed a lot. Yeah, it's not the anonymous. same. And I think too, yeah. just the excitement of something new made it like so right. much. But it was nothing worse than someone calling you and booting you off. <laughs> right, right. You had to learn the code to to uh, to turn off the uh, the call waiting. Coming, co that's yeah, what you had to yeah. do. Right. Oh my yeah. gosh. So but anyway, so. Off. You're at FAMU. You do your internship in Silicon Valley. I know that blows your mind. So then for your yeah. last two years of school, what does that do? And then, cause yeah, I, so I made, I made a really right after Jazz at Lincoln mm -hmm. Center. Okay, mm -hmm. so you gotta catch me up from there to there. <laughs> right. And then right. from okay. there to now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so I, like I said, I was there at a really interesting time. That was the summer that Netscape went public. So that's really oh. when the internet really took off and was yes. really born. Um, yeah. like literally at this time, like nobody had a website, like, there were no nope. websites. Like we were one of the only websites. The only reason we even had one is because we were a newspaper record in Silicon Valley. And because we, ha we knew we had a lot of readers who worked in technology because of mm -hmm. where our newspaper happened to be located. Right. Um, but that summer, everything changed and everybody realized, oh shoot, we should probably create a website. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I made a very interesting decision, which was even though I was right in the middle of it and I knew how to build websites and I knew how to code and I'm living literally in San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley, um, I decided I needed to go back to Tallahassee and uh, at the end of my internship, <laughs> no, no one pulled me to the side and said, hey, you know, you could just start a company out here and then right go back. Right here with us in about I mean? like, years. <laughs> It, 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 it literally didn't even cross my mind. Like it was just not anything anyone said to me. So I went back to Tallahassee. Okay. I, um, you know, I finished college. Um, and, uh, and when I graduated, I, I, I came right back to San Jose, right back to, to mm -hmm. Silicon Valley to work. Um, I worked for Knight Ritter, which was the corporate parent of the Detroit Free Press and mm -hmm. the San Jose Mercury News and many other newspapers. I think we had 36 um, properties or something like that at our peak. Um, but it was it was like the large respected national newspaper chain at the time. Definitely. The other big one was Gannett. Gannett but Knight yeah. Ritter was really kind of very different and had a very special culture um, and was not afraid to invest in the future and invest in, you know, R&D and, uh, and, and, and the Internet. And so right. I felt right at home um, and uh, got a chance to work on a lot of the very early versions of um, platforms that became products that some people still use today, like Career Builder or Cars.com mm -hmm. or Home Game, which started out as Home Hunter. Um, and one of the things that I got to do that was really cool, really interesting was um, I actually worked with Elon Musk at his first big company, which was called wow. Zip2. Um, yeah, they um, in Mountain View. They so what happened was Knight Ritter invested in Zip2, and um, my job was to what, what today would probably be called, you know, um, a UX strategist or a front end engineer. B basically, I did a combination of product management, user experience um, and usability um, design and uh, coding, front, front end coding. At that time, we didn't have all these separate job roles. It was like people just had to know how to do a lot of stuff. So anyway, so that was my job. And so I, I had to 
I was basically on loan to Zip2 to help them get these products off the ground. And my, my product was a real estate guide. And so literally I was sitting in a cube next to him for like a few weeks what? and I didn't even know. The funny thing is he was not the CEO of the company. Um, okay. So, you know, you wouldn't know. I mean, unless you knew that he was the founder of the company, you wouldn't know who he was. He was just another worker bee. Worker, there. yeah. Um, I knew who the CEO of the company was and I would be in meetings with the CEO sometimes, but Mm-hmm. Um, but I was sitting next to Elon and I didn't know that he was the founder of this company. And I was kind of wow. like, wow. Yeah. So it was, it was really interesting, um, just to see how far he's come and, and, and mm-hmm. all the amazing things he's doing, he's doing now to think that, you know, at one point I was like in the cube next to him in my yeah. career. So Knight Ritter was a really, um, sad kind of, um, you know, conclusion in terms of what happened with the company. It actually was, um, the company was, was, uh, you know, was shut down basically it was forced to dismantle itself and sell off its component parts which i didn't even realize was something that a company could be forced to do but right. if enough shareholders decide that's what should happen then that can happen and they had some activist yeah. shareholders who didn't like the investments in internet and felt like the company had lost its way so they did that i actually left before the company shut down um okay i moved i uh i i, I left knight ritter um and started a uh my first startup company which was called mega school and mm-hmm. we are a digital textbook company. Um, and then I moved to Michigan because uh, uh, my wife at the time wanted to go to graduate school at University of Michigan. And I couldn't talk her into going to like Stanford or Cal and staying out here. <laughs> She's oh, like, no, okay. I'm going to University of Michigan. I was like, okay. Great. So we, <laughs> Is she from Detroit? She's from she's from Michigan, yeah. So she um, okay. so she was like, no, I want to go to Michigan and be a Wolverine. So I said, okay. So we moved to Ann Arbor from San Jose. Uh, Mm -hmm. So she could go to school. Um, But, you know, we kept working on the company and we had um, we had a great model. Our model was basically we were building a Wikipedia style textbook. And the idea was that, yeah, there's a lot of duplication with textbooks. So our idea was if you had a dynamic textbook where it's easy to update it and you don't actually print it, you just put it all on a website and the schools all have access to the Internet so they can get their, you know, all their materials that way. We were essentially trying to build that kind of a combination of Wikipedia and Khan Academy rolled into one. We were just way too early because this is like 99, 2000, mm-hmm. 2001. So that was Khan very Academy early. is huge. Yeah, we were really early, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> schools weren't really ready. Schools weren't really ready for that type of a right. um, yeah, product. So what we learned from talking to schools is that they really needed help around training teachers how to use computers mm-hmm. just straight up. And so we pivoted and focused on that. And we did have some schools in Detroit um, that, that contracted with us. We provided um, training for teachers. We also did on-site um, technical support for schools so that they wouldn't okay. have to rely on central administration. If stuff broke, they had a contract with us, we'd come and fix it so the school okay. could keep running. Um, and so that company was mega school. Um, we ended up deciding to, um, to wind up the company and, and shut it down um, because we just... Um, when the tech bubble burst um, in mm-hmm. 2000, what happened was a lot of the big technology companies, they came into our lane and started offering the same services of the on-site contracts for support. Yeah. And then they wanted to subcontract us to do it. And it was just a terrible business deal. So we, we, we walked away from that. Gotcha. Um, yeah, yeah. So that just wasn't, you know, it just wasn't a, a, a great deal. But one of the things that happened for me was in the course of selling technology to schools, I got really passionate about the need to see dramatic change because I realized that even the schools that wanted to buy our product or our service, they couldn't do it because of red tape, because of bureaucracy and just because of the design of school systems. And, you know, I got super um, frustrated about that and, and, and a little bit angry to be honest. And so, you know, my dad, who of course was the P in the hope team, Um, If you know your Detroit uh, political history, the Hope team um, took over the Detroit school board um, Mm -hmm. uh, back in the back in the 80s. And uh, they brought in a lot of reforms. They actually created the first charter schools in the country. Um, They did a lot of innovative things. But my dad, who, you know, obviously was very knowledgeable about school policy and education policy, um, he took me with him to a symposium in Milwaukee that was convened by Howard Fuller, who's a legendary um, uh, civil rights activist and African liberation um, leader. 
he convened this uh, meeting in Milwaukee where he brought together just all of these black people from all over the country. We, we didn't know each other. We were all just black people <laughs> who cared about education. <laughs> and he got us all in one room. And uh, he, he, he essentially laid out it like, the, like the ultimate closing argument of all time um, for uh, you know, African-Americans and, and how we think about education and how it, how it intersects with our struggle for, for freedom and liberation. He just laid it out. Mm. It was like the I have a dream speech for education. <laughs> Amazing, okay. right? Um, this is pre-smartphone. Otherwise, it would be on YouTube with like 20 right, million. Right, somewhere. <laughs> but at the end of that speech, I'm telling you, by the end of that speech, like everybody in the room was kind of like, what do we need to do? Like, we'll run through a brick wall. Just tell us what to do. <laughs> so after that, after that meeting um, in Milwaukee, we organized another meeting in D.C. And um, a, lot of, a lot of influential Black leaders were there. Cory Booker was in the room. Hmm. Um, Eugene Wade was in the room, who's a you know legendary education entrepreneur. Jim Shelton, who was the head of Race to the Top under Obama, he also was the um, the head of education philanthropy for Bill Gates, and then he was okay. the head of education philanthropy for Mark Zuckerberg. So Jim Shelton is you know just uh, you know also a legend. Um, he was in the room. Tom Stewart was in the room. Um, he's the president of Patton University. So you you had like this crazy um collection of um black leaders from around the country who were really serious about doing something on education we met in dc at the mayflower hotel and we created an organization called bail the black alliance for educational options and um you know i i ultimately was um appointed to be the ceo of the organization um and served for almost five years scaling it from you know a handful of people like two people to um to a team of uh you know 26 and um, we just grew the organization and um we had chapters all over the country we we hosted the largest national gathering of um of uh, black parents and educators who were serious about education reform we did that every year we brought it to detroit a couple of times okay. um yeah and it was just an amazing an amazing experience one of our main achievements was just growing the charter school movement and scaling that, but more importantly, creating lots of opportunities for black educators to be able to create schools and to be able to focus on quality. You know, our okay. thing was our kids need options, but they need quality options. Quality options, right. And so we were really, um, we were really fighting for that. And so I did this whole chapter in my career, just this pivot on education reform, which was, you know, unexpected and, and right. And, it's kind of crazy. It's definitely to be a theme with you, um, the unexpected pivot. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot of really interesting pivots and jumps. You know, um, after Bale, I, uh, I, I, I was. Um, what happened was, I, what happened was, I was um, invited to participate in a fellowship for nonprofit CEOs, and okay. um, at Stanford Business School, and I did it, and it was amazing. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, organized by uh, Jim Fields, who was on faculty there, um, the black man who had organized this program. So I, I went and did the program. It was an amazing program. And uh, right after, I was like, that felt great. I think I want to go back to school. Because I was appointed CEO of Bayo. I was only 26 years old. So wow. I didn't even really have a chance to stop and catch my breath and think about, you know, grad school or anything like that. So now I'm like five years in. I'm like, you know, I think I want to go back to school and do a graduate program. And um, so I, I stepped down from Bayo to focus on graduate school. And uh, the second I did, like lit I think literally it was the day I sent off my application to Stanford. I think it literally was that same day. I got the phone call from Wynton Marcellus, the legendary oh, yeah. jazz trumpeter and composer oh, okay. and educator. He just called me up out the blue and was kind of like, hey, I, I want to talk to you about Jazz Lincoln Center and what we're doing and you should come help me do this. And, and I was kind of like, hey, man, I, I just I just left the job because <laughs> I don't want to go back to school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Winton, you know, Winton is an amazing leader. He's probably, I've, I've, I've one theme in my career is I've had an opportunity to work with amazing leaders. Um, at the Detroit mm -hmm. Free Press, I got to work with Bob Magruder and Greg Huskisson and Neil Shine and Louise Reed Ritchie um, and, at, and Heath Merriweather and, and, you know, at, uh, 
at uh, Bayo, I got an opportunity to work with, uh, with Howard Fuller and uh, Deborah McGriff, who's a former um, superintendent of Detroit Public Schools. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, Howard was just this amazing leader. I mean, he's just so intellectual and so powerful in his ability to inspire people and motivate them to action. And now I got Wynn Marcellus calling me, who's another right. you know, amazing leader. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the thing that blew me away about working with Winton was that, you know, he is so intellectual um, in addition to and on top of his ability to play the trumpet with mm-hmm. so, so much soul and technical virtuosity. Oh, um, beautiful. There's no one, there, there's really no one like that. It, it, like, imagine if Oprah just sat down and could just play like a piano concert. So you'd be like, <laughs> Oprah, I didn't know you were, where were you hiding at? Like, that's how Winton is. Like, like Winton, he, he has multiple domains where he just has this crazy ability level. And as a leader, just straight up, just management science, like leadership, like textbook leadership, he has an amazing capacity there. Um, as a composer, he's just an unprecedented composer and his, his, mm-hmm. his virtuosity and ability to write for classical and jazz um, mm-hmm. in lots of different configurations. Um, as an actual player, as a musician, there's never been anyone who had that level of virtuosity on classical trumpet and jazz trumpet. Yeah, like, trumpet, do you know how yeah. hard that, like you actually, actually know how hard that is because you're a musician. <laughs> right, our opening night for the symphony here in Jacksonville, um, last season, he played opening night. It was phenomenal. Yeah, he's just so a, much. he is an unprecedented individual. But what I, what I was getting ready to say in my story is that he, the thing that blew me away was, how much he reads. I'm like, how do you have time? Like, aren't you writing symphonies and practicing scale? Like, don't you need to go practice long tones, bro? Like, how do you have time? <laughs> like, I'm reading these books because this is my job, but how right. do you have time to read the same books I'm reading and be caught up on all this stuff? But he, he does, he's, he's, a, he, he's a speed reader and has a voracious appetite for knowledge. That's um, awesome. So yeah, so many, many uh, great conversations were had um, mm-hmm. in his kitchen, as well as in the boardroom. But so mm-hmm. I worked for Jazz Lincoln Center for almost two years, had a great experience there. I really created the blueprint for the organization in, t- in regard to digital and mm-hmm. um, kind of corporate strategy, kind of giving them an ambitious plan to think about how can we grow and scale out what we're doing to make Jazz Lincoln Center a formidable um, force across multiple industries. Um, it's already the largest organization in the world of jazz. But um, mm-hmm. they're in many, many industries. They op- operate a nightclub, a concert hall. Mm-hmm. They have a library. They have a publishing arm, a record label. They have all of these pieces. And my job was to put it all together and um, create a good gumbo, create a good blueprint, <laughs> a good recipe for how it could all come together. They're certainly always and streaming. So I, I had a great time doing that. And then the way, yeah, me too. <laughs> and I love it. I love it when it organically uh-huh. pops up and it's Jazz Lincoln yep. Center. It's like, ooh, a free show. Right. <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. Um, so I um so so now this gets to where you and I met, which is uh, exactly. in New York. In New York. Yes, mm-hmm. I was, was working. I was left. working. I mean, you yep. literally just left jazz. Yeah, just just. I think left. I met you there, and then you yeah. were gone. Yeah. 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 And the reason why was um behind the scenes. Um, you know, I was being I was being heavily recruited to uh become CEO of a new nonprofit organization that was being created and launched in the U.S. Um, it was the U.S. Um, arm of a global charity called Inspire, um, which right. operates a website in Australia, which is I was very helping successful. with that while I was looking yes. for a job. <laughs> yes, yes. And you were amazing. And you were amazing. You were a huge, a huge help, a huge help as we were getting it off the ground um, from the New York office. Um, and the vision was to use technology to try to help young people who are going through tough times, to try to normalize tough times, destigmatize mental health, and help seeking around mental health issues. And we saw a lot of ways we could use technology through apps, through um, you know, creating website that had um, fact sheets where young people could get kind of just real straight talk, like not a lot of preachy or judgmental kind of um, white papers, but like fact fact sheets and 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 practical uh, thing. Yeah, practical explanatory information to help people understand what they're going through. Right. So we did that. We built a community of young people around that to help help each other. 
Um, and importantly, it got, it got me back to the Bay Area, got, got me back to Silicon Valley and back to San yep. Francisco, which, which is where I wanted to be. Um, so you were leaving and I was sad, like, I like this, <laughs> but you're going away. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a lot of fun. That was a, that was a great, that was a great time and, and a great experience. You know, anytime you start something new, like the beginning of something is always really exciting. And exciting. so thank you for helping me get it off the ground. It was, um, thank you a for lot letting me, I was bored I was kind of depressed. <laughs> My, that, that New York plan did not go the way I envisioned, and I ended up coming right back to Florida. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think part of one of the things about resilience and, you know, th that's one of the things we actually learned a lot about from doing the work with Inspire is that, you know, resilience is really everything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have to teach, we have to teach young people, but we also have to remind each other that the ability to bounce back and be resilient is a superpower it is. and um, we all have to tap into it. You know, sure. we all do from time to time. So how did you so, get from inspired to where you are now? Because I understand you're doing something I didn't even know existed. Right. So, so yeah. So what I'm doing now is I, I, uh, I run the San Francisco campus for Northwestern university. Um, yes, that Northwestern. Yeah, uh, the one how did that happen? <laughs> a lot of universities now are starting to think of themselves more globally and start to mm -hmm. think about how they can create opportunities for their students to be immersed and learn about the culture of different places that are important. And uh, Silicon Valley obviously is very important. Obviously. San Francisco yeah. Bay Area is really important. And so, you know, Northwestern has made this very bold move to come to downtown San Francisco and put up purple banners everywhere. And, you know, we have the 18th <laughs> floor in a skyscraper, you know, we, um, um, we're making a serious effort to, you know, not just create um, a learning opportunity for our students, but also to engage and energize our alumni here in the Bay Area. Um, mm -hmm. While, you know, hopefully shifting the conversation that's happening in tech around media and news. Um, you know, that's really important, really critical. I, I actually work for the Medill School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing Communications. And so we're very focused on. Yeah, <laughs> right. It makes sense. The dots connect <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And actually the person, the person who actually kind of tapped me on the shoulder and made me aware that the university was recruiting for this particular role um, was someone that I had as a professor at FAMU. Um, oh who's now on faculty at, at uh, Medill. So, okay. um, you know, all of those dots, they, they, they really do. Yeah. They always uh, connect. So, um, so yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, a really unique, it's a really unique initiative in the sense that we're taking a, a super interdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to um, cross-pollinate across business, law, media, marketing, engineering, and kind of combine all of these things in ways that reflect, um, you know, the future of where work is going and the future of um, how problem solving uh, is going to happen. Gotcha. Um, which is, you know, a tough thing for a university to pull off, but um, that is exactly, you know, our charge and our mission and what we're, what we're trying to do. Well, with you at the helm of this part of it, I see nothing but success because if I've heard nothing else this whole time we've been talking is that you have a tendency to get into some really disruptive, innovative pivots. Like it's always this new thing. Like you were there at the dawn of this and the emergence of that and the intersection of this. So you're, you've got experience in those kind of environments. So it's like, this is like the perfect storm for you as far as I see it up to this point. Um, and I think that's awesome. They're very lucky to have you because you have, you have the chops and the experience to back it up. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough challenge, but I'm up for it. And, uh, you know, one thing I love, and I'm, I'm glad that you're doing this, um, this show because, you know, the Detroit diaspora is really powerful mm -hmm. and I can testify to that. Even, even here in Silicon Valley, you know, um, we're, we're a long way from home. But, you know, Detroit people and Detroit network is super tight. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I rely on it every day. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's true. It's, it's unbelievable how much it still, it still factors into everything I do every day. 
That's awesome. So I know you're entrepreneurial at heart as well. So are there any other things going on in the periphery that we should know about? Any upcoming stuff? Any? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I kind of skipped over that, but I, I started a few companies here and there. Uh, okay. I sold two. I sold. I sold two of them, and two of them failed. So half the time, okay. I know what I'm talking about, and the other half. <laughs> Man, that's business. I don't even want to hear that. That's business. That's just how it goes. You win some, you lose some. Hopefully, you get to the point where you can really cash in those chips. So. Yeah, I mean, the next thing. The next thing now is, um, you know, looking at uh, the investor side of things. I'm, I'm actively advising. Uh, a few startup founders um, who have great companies. Um, and I really like doing that. Um, uh, I really enjoy passing back, you know, the answers and what I figured out and what I've learned along the way to young entrepreneurs who are trying to figure it out and make it. Um, sure. And so I think for me, you know, a next, a next step um, that, you know, really is happening in parallel with my role um, at Northwestern is, uh, is becoming even more active as an investor mm -hmm. um, and maybe even potentially looking at doing a fund. Um, so, you know, this is a great okay. time. If you, if you have the connections and you have the, the knowledge and kind of the depth around, um, you know, emerging industries, I would say, um, it, this is a great time to, uh, to be looking at the investor side of things. The, sure. the trick is really thinking about emerging industries and where you where you feel like you can sort of time things well in terms of when mainstream society will catch up to where emerging um, mm -hmm. industries want to want to want to take us. Definitely. That's so awesome. Um, you have just taken us on such a ride. I just I feel like I've traveled through time. You took me back <laughs> and now we're to the future. And you took me back with the AOL uh, <laughs> screen name. Oh my God. I can hear the I can hear the handshake, the modem handshake now. No, I can hear it. Yeah, all thanks of for those. that. Oh goodness. Yes. Those were the days. And all of those AOL CDs. We've had stacks of them. Like, why are we going to see? <laughs> right. Right. So now let's right. transition. So you've told us all about your journey. I do want to make a pit stop at, you kind of touched on the whole Detroit connection, but in your experience, what makes the D so special? You talk about your network that you do rely on on a consistent basis, but what is it about your, a collection of your experiences and your just context and everything about that, when we talked about in the beginning, your foundational growth as a Detroiter, like what makes that so special for you and how has that kind of like been a thread through your whole experience so far? Yeah, I would say, you know, the theme or the through line is probably grit and resilience mm -hmm. more than anything else. I mean, if I describe the culture of Detroit, um, that's a big piece of it. You know, you remember there was this amazing ad that Chrysler did, the imported from Detroit ad that they did yeah. for the Chrysler 200 that had Eminem in it. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the theme of that ad. The ad was really about resilience and grit. And right. it was saying, listen, you know, we might've got knocked down, but we're getting back up. And that's what we do. That's what we're about. And, you know, tying it in with Eminem and Eight Mile and the comeback and not giving <laughs> up. And I mean, it's just the perfect kind of embodiment of like the culture and, and the theme of what, of what we're about. And I would say that's true for me as well. Um, the, the most important lesson or the kind of the most important thing that I experienced growing up in a D is just the idea that, um, you know, you can only be stopped if you let somebody stop you. Mm. You know, if you let somebody stop you, if you let somebody get in your way and create obstacles and, uh, you know, you give up trying to get around those obstacles, then okay, fine, you're done. Mm. But, you know, D D Detroiters, we have a way of being just relentless in our, um, in our desire and our approach to uh, try to solve a problem. Like, we don't give up. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the city now, like, the city is, like, off the meters. The city is oh doing my God. so much amazing stuff. The construction, the level of construction is, like, you know, just off the chart. Like, mm -hmm. we just don't give up. No. And, um, and I love that about the D. I think the yeah. other thing is just, you know, I guess realness and, you know, mm -hmm. every city thinks they're real. 
Every city thinks. I'm, I, you know, I'm very close to Oakland. Like people from Oakland, they think they're body about it. They think they're super real, you know, and they are right. in a way. Yeah. But there's something really special about Detroit and the calmness of people being calm in the skin they're in. Mm. And people from Detroit, you know, now we can flash. I mean, you know, we can, <laughs> we can show out with the best of them. Okay. <laughs> We know how to do that. Yeah. But at the same time, we can also be, we can also see each other and be super real. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very big difference. And, uh, and I just love that realness of, of being seen and seeing each other, speaking to each other, uh, greeting each other on the streets, even people you don't know. Mm -hmm. All of those things culturally feel very Detroit to me. Yeah. Um, when I walk around the streets in other cities, you know, people don't necessarily speak to each other. Greet no. each other. When I was growing up in Detroit, it's like everybody spoke to everybody, even yeah. if you didn't know them. Yeah. Um, and so that that's a big that's really a big a big part of it is the realness and the humility of um, of people from Detroit. And the last thing I would say is just, you know, the soulfulness of Detroit, whether it's, you know, with hair, whether <laughs> it's how we do church. Mm -hmm. whether it's music like the through line in all of that is really soulfulness it's it's yeah. you know Motown worked because Barry Gordy was genius in being able to capture the soulfulness and focus more on the soulfulness rather than say the technical polish of the recording or um you know the perfection of the intonation of the singers or, I mean, you go back, you listen to some Motown tracks, you realize, man, that's a little bit out of tune. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's it works. soulful, it's soulful. Yeah. The soulfulness of the singing is unbelievable, especially when you compare it to what other music was out around that time. Right. Um, and you know, the same for how we do church and, and everything else, the way we dress, like it's just a very soulful kind of, um, Food. Kind of culture, the food. Right, mm. Mr. Fofo's. Right, I mean, you know, like mm. the food is also. I know my mom is like, no, okay, now you now wait, 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 we can't get ahead of it. <laughs> That's coming up. Wait a minute, we can't get ahead of it. <laughs> my mom is gonna be so mad. <laughs> so I'm a foodie, so I don't want to ruin that part. We're getting to okay. that. Okay, all right, all right, so we're gonna, okay. we're gonna leave it there. I really do agree with, with what you said, and I mean. There's actually a lot of Detroiters in Jacksonville, Florida. I meet a lot of Detroiters here. And it's so funny because it, it is a certain type of person. I swear, right. I had really as I was seeing a client, you know, I'm a business consultant. I'm consulting somebody on their nonprofit. And this is somebody that I had known for a couple of years socially. And we're just da 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 da, -da And she said something about, oh, Detroit. And I was like, you from Detroit? Send me. She's like, yeah. I was like, me too. She's like, really? Like, how do we not know that? <laughs> right. Kind of. It, 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 I love it. Like, oh, that's why we have this. And then we just talked about Detroit for like an hour after right. the consultation. So she was here for a while, and uh, it was so awesome because it's just this. It's almost this palpable thing. You it is. It. You can feel. That's it. why I tell people all the time about Jamel. So I, like I said, I know J Jamel since. I mean, we met when uh, we were. Was, 17 or 16. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I've known her to like, we go way back. I mm -hmm. tell people like, J that's Jamel. That's really Jamel. Right. Like, and her, you know, her whole thing, her whole persona, everything is like, that's her. There's no, there's right. not a lot of daily. Um, because she's just super real. And that's like a great, she's another person who's just a great embodiment of like Detroit culture and what we're about. Mm -hmm. mm, definitely. So yeah. I just very outspoken. I said what I said. This is right. what I think. I don't care. Right. I don't agree. Right. I see yeah. you, but you see me too. Like you, right. I can see you, but you got to see me too. And it's like a very, that's how Detroiters are, you know? Yeah. That's you can true. get it out of, the other thing that I learned, <laughs> I got to say it's real fast. The other thing that I learned in Detroit, because let's be honest, Detroit is like, when I say real, I mean, realness can be interpreted a lot of ways, but you know, I mean, people in Detroit Authentic. are not afraid to fight. I mean, they're not going to back down from a fight, fight necessarily. And we are known okay. for that. But the other side of that, and I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just being, I'm just keeping it real. The mm -hmm. other side of that is Detroit is one of the places where almost any problem, almost any problem or disagreement or scrap can be resolved with respect 
and seeing each other. It's right. not like that everywhere. Like no. Detroit is the kind of place where you can be about to have a serious fisticuffs, but if the right words are said to say, acknowledge, I see you, I'm sorry, that's my bad, I didn't mean, it can all go away really quick. Okay. It's not like that. It's not true everywhere, at least not in my experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> So oh, it's, no, the, it's, the, it's the it's the it's the it's yeah. yeah 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 anyway. it's, a, I mean, it's a very unique place and another reason why this podcast is so important to me is because since I left Detroit and went to FAMU like that was culture shock for me Tallahassee yes. was great me culture too. shock yeah it was from huge culture shock my only references for Florida at that point in my life were Disney World and Miami Vice so, I said the same thing. <laughs> I said, I thought Tallahassee was going to be a combination between Miami Vice and Disney World. Man, <laughs> I got down there and thought I was in like, Georgia. Yeah, it was Southern Georgia. That's what they joke and right. say. And I was just like, wow. And then that, you compound that with having these people from everywhere. So you get all these, all these, all these different vernacular, like Philly slang. Man, it took me so long to understand. Like, what's a John? A John is a better right. Like, what are you actually is saying? Everything. Like, is there a T at the end, or yeah. is it an N? Like, how does that? Oh, like, John, like, what letter is at the end of that? Man, and then they had to then they had to explain it because I I tried to pick up on it and they were using like just a general noun substitute and I was like, wait. So one of my friends she said it was in reference to like a guy. Like, oh, that's your John, and I was like. John, I'm not a prostitute. You know, I'm like, I'm confused. Like, what are you saying? You need to be clear. That's hilarious. Is. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, you're right. I, you know, I hadn't thought about that aspect, but it's true because it wasn't just the culture shock of the Southern culture and that deep South culture. It was also Black people who came from all from of these everywhere. other cities. So you had the Chicago people, they were all deep. Yep. You had the New York people and the New Philly people. people. Then Virginia, you had the DC people DC, who were on a completely yeah. different vibe. And Girl then the Atlanta music. Ah. It's like, yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, that's, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that in a really long time. But that's yeah, it was just true. a very, very interesting uh, mix of everything. And it, it was funny yes. because it also got me to see that where that, I think that's when I finally realized that where I'm from is not like everywhere else. Because it was like, I mean, just like they had their words, I'm saying gym shoes in the show. And they're like, what? And pop. Oh, I still say it just. Oh, the show. Right. You're right. Yeah. We're the ones that say the show. I, mm -hmm. You know, I still just say the show and everybody knows what I mean from context. But you're right. I, I, I never even thought of that as a Detroit thing we say but you're I right I had a very confusing conversation <laughs> around that so. and that's how I know because a friend of mine great. ended up going to Florida State so we were both in Tallahassee together we had a mutual friend he says so where is she and I'm like oh she's at the show what show I'm like <laughs> the show at the mall what show at the mall and I'm like the AMC 20 theater. like what is <laughs> oh, the Cineplex do you prefer that right I'm like <laughs> I didn't know that people didn't great. know what that was, you know. So right. it was learning that I yes. had my little bubble and other people had all of theirs and we had to learn how to speak each other's language, so to speak. And it yes. was just it was fascinating. Um I, I, I it was it. a great experience. So let's get to the fun part. Let's get okay. to the this is the Fab Five, is what I call this segment. So these are okay. gonna be about your favorite Detroit things. We have different categories. I'll introduce them okay. and then you got to tell us, you got to let us know what's your right. favorite stuff. All right. Okay. So got number it. one, what is your favorite Detroit place or landmark? Uh, favorite Detroit place or landmark would be the spirit of Detroit and the Joe Louis fist. Okay. The Joe Louis fist, when they first put it up, I didn't really like it because it just felt too forced. But now that's like the rawest monument ever built. <laughs> like the rawest. It's a, it's a big black fist standing in the air of the greatest boxer of all time. Oh, no, that's the Joe Lewis fist. And, and the spirit of Detroit, because the spirit of Detroit is just so, it's so classic and beautiful. And I just love it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So those are great answers. I, I don't know if anybody said those yet, but those are good. Okay. Number Runner two. up would be the DIA and the old Cast Tech building. 
Oh, cool. Well, Chad mentioned the old cast tag, yes. We the old cast tag building. Was awesome. our heart, the pickle factory. Yeah. We the pickle factory. Forever. Right. <laughs> right. All right. Number two, your favorite restaurant or dish, past or current. So this one gets a little complicated for some. So let's see how you do Okay. It. Ooh, that's hard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Favorite dish. Is... Restaurant or dish. Okay, so you're giving it to me in pieces. That's fine. Okay. Oh, I, I can only pick one. It's either got to be a restaurant or a dish. No, well, I'll let you have. I'll let you talk. Yeah, I, I, people have their favorites. I won't touch you. All right, all right, all right. Restaurant. Okay, I'm going to try to do it quick. So, right. American, American Coney Island. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my spot. I spent way too much money there. Um, probably <laughs> saved some years off my life eating American Coney Island. But... It, <laughs> Um, Mr. Fofo's is gone, but the cake for Mr. Fofo's when I was a kid was, was really great. Mm -hmm. Um, and Buddy's Pizza. Mm. Um, yeah, I miss some days. I just miss that Buddy's Pizza. Um, Detroit has a lot of great pizza. So I'm not, no disrespect to any other, you know, Little Caesars, Jets, Dino's, Pizza Popular. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of great ones. Hungry Howie's, Domino's. We, we kind of run pizza. but. <laughs> That buddies, I don't know. That was the one by Sigma Plaza. That was like the one. Yeah. Really? Okay. And you all know, right. I, I, I annoy I annoy everybody when we travel because everywhere we go all over the world, when I see Little Caesars and Domino's, I have to point it out and do do the drive by and just make sure everybody understands that's from Detroit. That's from Michigan. You know, and claim <laughs> that. <laughs> and they're like, it's just a pizza place. I'm like, no, no, no. It's a pizza place from where I'm from. Do you understand how that works? Like, we're yeah. in Australia and y'all are eating my pizza. Like, I was about to... <laughs> right. That's right. hilarious. That's yeah, hilarious. hilarious. All right. Number three. Yes. Your favorite downtown event. So any event that exclusively occurs in the downtown Detroit area. <sighs> That is so hard. I mean, the fireworks are the obvious one. The fireworks, the Detroit fireworks are just unbelievable. So I would, ha I would probably have to go with the fireworks. Um, okay. You know, Thanksgiving Day Parade is also unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And African World Festival is just mm -hmm. That's the ultimate. come up in many, many other interviews. Yes. That's the ultimate. I mean, I feel like I was there like during the peak of when it really started to get huge, like pre-internet, when it really started to get huge, just from word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And everyone saying, are you going, are you going, are you going? And like, we all just went and it was just, it was a monster, just took over the whole, the whole city. Yeah, um, definitely. But yeah, those fireworks, man, it's really hard to appreciate how special the, the Detroit fireworks are. Um, but as somebody who loves fireworks and seen fireworks all over the world, those are some amazing fireworks. Okay, awesome. That's good to know because I have only seen those and a couple of others. <laughs> well, this is a problem. You're going to go somewhere else and be disappointed like, man, that wasn't all that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our fireworks are better than that. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. You get real spoiled. Right on the fireworks and the pizza. Okay. And the pizza. Although I, I'll say Sydney, Australia had nice fireworks. I'll give them their props, but you know. Okay. It's not okay. as good as ours. But... <laughs> <laughs> I hate bring them on. Okay. I'm going to get All in trouble right. for that comment later. Yeah, sure, sure. Not my fault. <laughs> All right, so number four, your yeah. favorite Detroit sports team? The Pistons. The Pistons, no doubt. Love the Pistons. The Ben Wallace era was, you know, and Chauncey and Rip. I mean, that was just, mm -hmm. she, that was just like a crazy run. Um. <laughs> Like, I've, like, I'm, you know, they have the Sports Illustrated ad where they try to get you to subscribe to Sports Illustrated ad and they throw in the commemorative edition of the, mm. I bought all of that just because I was just like, <laughs> that was such an amazing run. It felt mm -hmm. so good. I wasn't living in Detroit at the time, so it was extra special for me okay. um, just to see the Pistons be so dominant in, in, in that time. So, yeah, yeah. The Pistons, I, I love the Tigers. It was horrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Tigers, yeah. yeah. I love the Tigers. I have fond memories of being a kid, you know, when uh, when Kirk Gibson was was hitting it out, yeah. you know, hitting it, hitting it out the park and stuff. Tiger Stadium right. and um, the course, the Detroit Lions, you know, you you got to be. So are a you Lions picking fan. one? Or are you just naming them all? Because 
You just I'm with the Pistons. The other ones too. Okay. I'm I mean, because you know, I mean, yeah, the Lions on Thanksgiving you Day, like, and you know, you were like, <laughs> yes. I'm doing the tour of all the teams. No, but but really, it would be it would be the Pistons. It's the Pistons. Okay. Not the bad boys though. You. you the bad boys era was unbelievable too i mean yeah. john sally like i was always so john sally was always my favorite basketball player really? for the okay Pistons. Ma- magic johnson is my absolute fa- best favorite basketball player of all time right? ever okay but john sally in terms of all of the pistons who play john sally is my favorite piston of all time people always thought that was weird they're like well he's not that good i'm like first of all yes he is Second of all, <laughs> his nickname is the Spider. spider like, come yeah. on, man, that's a dope nickname. <laughs> and he had a, <laughs> and he had a great sense of humor. I just thought John Sally was just hilarious. Was so talented. And now he's on, you know, on on, uh, you know, DJ Vlad and stuff. He's like still out there. Like I love John Sally. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a huge yeah. John Sally, and he's vegan. Like we have so much. Oh, I yeah? love John Sally. Okay, Sally, I didn't get know out. That. Let's do something. <laughs> <laughs> I love John I Sally. Listen to this. That would be nice. We so love- yeah, bad bad boys era was you know I mean of course that's like that's like the ultimate that's the ultimate. Yeah. People forget that Michael Jordan, the bad boys actually trained Michael Jordan how to be Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. He's the bad boys taught Michael Jordan how to do all of the stuff you need to do to actually mm-hmm. win championships. Mm-hmm. I think Michael Jordan will admit that now, even though he's super competitive. <laughs> yeah, that bad boys era was was great. I think yeah. I couldn't appreciate it as much because I was you know I was a little kid, but. Um, but yeah, of course, that's like you know legendary. Yeah, that was. I think that's what really got me. I mean, my dad was a big basketball fan before that. Anyway, he loved the Lakers and the Celtics rivalry and then all that. But it was like the Bad Boys was what got me personally invested into basketball. Mm-hmm. And then when we lost, when we didn't repeat, I didn't watch basketball for like thirteen years. Yeah, that was that was it was too emotional. That was hard. It was it. emotional. I agree. It was. <laughs> it was. It was. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's not go back there. All right. So <laughs> number five. Yeah. Our last question. Then we gotta let you go. Your favorite Detroit memory. And what I mean by that is a memory that you have that's so Detroit, it couldn't have happened anywhere else any other way. Nelson Mandela was freed by the government of South Africa when he came to the United States. The first place he went was Detroit. Mm-hmm. Um, he came to Tiger Stadium. Tiger Stadium. We had a massive rally. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm going to say Stevie Wonder was there. Frankie Beverly and Mays was there. It was like a huge, we just had a, just a party just all mm-hmm. afternoon and all night before yeah. he actually came out and addressed the crowd. It was and, televised. I mean, we were there like six hours. I mean, it was like okay. an all-day thing. Yeah. Um, Nelson Mandela coming on stage in a packed Tiger Stadium full of people who held him down and actively fought for him to be released for all those years. We never actually thought it was going to happen. I mean, mm-hmm. I should say that differently. I'm sure older people, they had no idea if it was ever going to happen. Right. Young people like me, we actually thought that we were the straw that broke the camel's back because, mm-hmm. you know, when I learned about Nelson Mandela and I got passionate about it and started writing letters and we started doing protests and stuff like that at Cass, like we, we thought our effort was, <laughs> was actually was the real. reason. <laughs> our effort had nothing to do with it. But in our minds, it was like, we did it. We did it. So we, yeah. we felt a very powerful sense of ownership. But right. Nelson Mandela coming on stage, mm-hmm. and he actually messed it up. He called it Motor Town. Right, I remember that. <laughs> Instead of he meant the Motor City or Motown, you could say either Motor City or Motown. Motown. He said Motor Town. Motown. I remember that. But it was so genuine and heartfelt. Mm-hmm. It was so genuine and heartfelt, and I and I and I'm in this stadium full of people, and we're all chanting and he's that was the most Detroit that was like the ultimate connection of the diaspora of Mm. like we are here we are seen he sees us Mm -hmm. we see him he's out and it is it just felt like this very powerful like culmination and 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 turning of of a chapter 
just... I agree. I remember that. I watched it on television at my grandparents' house. And I don't think, because I, what year was that? 90? Uh, I think that was, um, no, it was, uh, I think it was 89. It was either oh, 89 okay. or 90. Hang on. Oh, gee. Okay, so I'm way off. But I was young, young. <laughs> so I don't yeah. think I really realized how important that was at the actual mm -hmm. time it happened. But mm -hmm. I remember watching it and seeing how right. excited everyone was. So it is, at, right. you know, I, but I remember when he said that, when you said that, I, I can hear his voice saying it. Yes. Right. Yeah, um, it was 90. 90. It was 1990. Yeah. So I was 10. Yeah. So I don't think I was really up on the whole political piece of that. At that moment. And the day they, the day they announced it, the day, <clears throat> the day uh, they announced it and they broadcast it on, uh, they interrupted programming on the television news to announce it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how we found out because there was no internet. Um, right. But somehow it was announced. And I believe that uh, David Sneed at Cast Tech actually came on the PA system and made the announcement. Like I think wow. he actually like made a school wide announcement. And we wow. literally just, we like came out of class into the hallways and we're like high fiving and hugging and yeah. crying. <laughs> and then the next day, the next day, uh -huh we basically canceled all the classes and we just wow. held, we just held a rally in the recital hall at Cast Tech and we did performances all day. Wow. LZ Granderson, LZ Granderson, the CNN commentator and journalist. He was a uh, part of that group. Um, okay. Yeah. So there, there was like a, I mean, it was, it was like really emotional. That, that's a whole other level. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Man, so I can't believe it's over. I had so <laughs> This was super fun. Yeah, I'd be, yes. let's do it again. Definitely. So keep us updated on what you're doing. Hopefully we can circle back around maybe next season and catch up with you again. Maybe get it. Yeah, that would be cool. Discussion. But thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you, Lawrence. You have been a wonderful addition to our collection thus far. You're going to kick off our second season. How cool is that? At this point, That's I, awesome. I have to make this two episodes because this was longer than I wanted, but it's chock full of stuff and I don't want to like overwhelm the listeners. So I think this deserves, you're going to be our first two-parter. Look at you making history again. <laughs> <laughs> Just wrap uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been really a pleasure and it was super fun. And uh, yes. I look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Thanks All so much. Right. Well, thank you so much. This has been awesome. This is the Detroit Hustle Podcast. Catch up with us next week where we have our next guest lined up and you're going to love it. Bye.